time to talk about how antibiotics work. So we spent a lot of time talking about um, things that you use against bacteria. So you guys um, did your little thing where you, I assigned you a drug and then you researched it briefly and then we just talked about it. And so um, really overall what you have to know about antibiotics is not, not all those specific drugs. So you know in those slides there's a ton of different drugs. It's not that you have to know that, it's more about like the mechanism. So like if I give you an example, you have to tell me in general like what is it doing, like how does it work, okay? Um, so I wanted to make sure that I also told you about some of the other classes of drugs besides antibiotics. So that's where I'm gonna start now before I move on to um, the next uh, chapter. All right, so we spent the beginning of the semester um, talking about the fact that there are different microorganisms, right? That we have bacteria, we have fungus, we have viruses, we have worms. And so the drugs are not one size fits all. Like the drugs that you're gonna use on bacterial infections are not gonna work on fungus necessarily. And so I just wanted to reiterate that to you guys. So as far as antifungal drugs, uh, they work in a similar way in that they inhibit the cell wall. But remember that fungus are not bacteria. So the way they inhibit the cell wall is gonna be different. So it's not gonna be about peptidoglycan because fungus don't have peptidoglycan. It's gonna be other substances that are getting inhibited. So the fungal cell wall um, is made out of um, slightly different sugar um, that's called glucan. And glucan is kind of synonymous with peptidoglycan and bacteria. So there are drugs that inhibit glucan. So it's a newer class of drugs that are called echinocandins. And they work on inhibiting um, the glucan synthase. And so when you inhibit that glucan synthase, then the fungus won't make their cell wall properly. So that's why it's antifungal, is because it's affecting a sugar that fungus need to make their cell wall. Um, another target um, that's used really um, commonly are this drug called cytosine. It's an analog of cytosine, which if you remember when we learned about um, DNA, we said you had A, T, C, and G. Well, C is cytosine, and this drug interferes with RNA um, synthesis, and so you don't get to make proteins properly. So if you remember when we talked about um, antibiotics, we said you could inhibit protein synthesis by inhibiting the ribosome. That doesn't really work so well with fungus because they're more similar to us. So if we inhibited their ribosome, there's a good chance we would interfere with our own ribosome. And so that's why to some degree, um, antifungal drugs can have a little more side effect potential because fungus are more similar to us than bacteria. Does, does that make sense? Like, so the drugs that you're gonna take against bacteria are gonna just harm the bacteria and they're so different from us that it typically won't affect us negatively, although we can have allergies to certain antibiotics. So it still goes back to our original targets that we talked about. How can you inhibit a microbe? You can inhibit its cell wall. You can inhibit its metabolism, you can inhibit its protein synthesis. But if you're dealing with fungus, it's not gonna be an antibiotic that you're using. It's gonna be different class of drugs that are called antifungals, because that means against fungus. Now antivirals, um, it's the same principle. Um, they're not gonna work on bacteria, because viruses are not bacteria. Um, the thing about viruses I think that's important to remember from kind of a public health standpoint, is that many of them don't have treatments. Like if you get a virus, you just have to like ride it out. Um, there's some experimental treatments, like I did hear that they just approved the antibody for COVID emergency patients that are really sick. Um, but for the most part, most viruses are easier to prevent than they are to treat. And that's where vaccination becomes really important for viral <coughs> illnesses. And really, probably the only way we'll get rid of COVID, I think, is to get a vaccine that works properly. Um, but there are some drugs that will attack viruses. And if you remember, because viruses are obligate intracellular, they have to get inside of the host. 
And so a lot of antiviral drugs target that process. They prevent them from getting inside the host, or they prevent them from leaving the host cell. Or once they're in, they prevent them from replicating and taking over the host cell like they normally would. So really it's the same principle when you have an antimicrobial, whether it's antiviral, antibacterial, antifungal, it is attempting to inhibit something that that thing needs to survive. And that's how it acts as a therapeutic, is that you inhibit something that that thing is trying to do so that it can't do that thing and make you sick. Um, so there are drugs for, um, like if you have outbreaks of uh, herpes, there's some good drugs now for hepatitis. Um, a lot of them are uh, what you call nucleoside and nucleotide analogs. They mutate, they cause mutations in the RNA and the DNA, and then they can't replicate properly. And then some of them interfere with the enzymes that are necessary for leaving or entering a host cell. So like um, Tamiflu and Relenza, they both block an enzyme that the flu has called um, neuraminidase, so they're neuraminidase inhibitors. And that prevents the flu virus from leaving the host cell. And so that's why the symptoms then will start to go down because the infection is propagated by them leaving the host cell and then infecting other cells that are nearby. Um, a really interesting therapy is with HIV, which this is something that will come up again later when we talk about HIV. So they call it highly active antiretroviral uh, therapy. So um, HIV are retroviruses. The way that they replicate is that they reverse transcribe their RNA or their DNA into RNA. Or excuse me, I said it backwards. They reverse transcribe so that they can take their RNA and incorporate it into the host DNA. So normally transcription would be going from DNA to RNA, but HIV is going from RNA to DNA. And so that's how they're able to incorporate into the host cell. So usually if you take HIV medication, um, a lot of the pills are, are, are nice now because it's medications that are combined into one pill, so you don't have to take as many. But usually you're gonna take more than one because each class of drugs has different target. So as far as HIV replicating, one of the big targets is reverse transcriptase. So reverse transcriptase is the enzyme that HIV uses to reverse transcribe it's RNA into DNA. And so notice that there are a ton of drugs that inhibit reverse transcriptase. And again, you don't have to know all the names of the drugs. A lot of them have um, endings that um, are, are the same. So like these ene drugs, those are all like reverse transcriptase inhibitors for the most part. And then they do it in different ways, which again, you guys don't have to know it that specifically, but just understand like why would that inhibit HIV because it needs reverse transcriptase to replicate. So if you inhibit reverse transcriptase, then it can't replicate. So that was one of the earliest um, HIV drugs that came out. It was called AZT, and it was a reverse transcriptase inhibitor. Um, now they have even more sophisticated drugs. So they have what are called fusion or entry inhibitors. That literally tells you what it does. It inhibits entry. It inhibits viral fusion with the host cell. And so if you're taking, um, like you guys have heard of PrEP before, which is pre-exposure prophylaxis, so like the Truvada, there's been commercials for it on TV. It has, uh, I believe it has a fusion inhibitor in it because that will prevent HIV from even getting in in the first place. Okay, so it's a good preventative drug because it'll prevent it from getting in. And if you take it regularly and practice safe sex, it makes transmission almost zero, like 99% effective. Um, other drugs will inhibit uh, the ability of it to leave the cell. And so those are the protease inhibitors. So protease is an enzyme that HIV uses to escape. And so if you inhibit protease, they can't escape. If they can't escape, they can't infect other cells. And so that's how you block the virus. Um, and then they have integrase inhibitors. So remember I said that um, 
What HIV does is it reverse transcribes its RNA into DNA. The reason it does that is so that it can put, it literally inserts itself into your DNA. So that's viral DNA right there. And so if you take an integrase inhibitor, those are drugs that prevent that from happening. So imagine you're putting X's through these areas where the virus would attempt to replicate itself. So these drugs inhibit or stop those different processes. Okay, so that's a little bit about the HIV medications. Um, this data is a little bit older now, but because I think they have a different formulation of this drug now. But a couple years ago, um, they came up with a functional cure for hepatitis C. So hepatitis C is one where uh, surprisingly like a lot of boomers were getting it um, because they were getting like blood transfusions like back in the 80s or maybe some kind of sketchy tattoo or IV drug users. They didn't have a test for hepatitis C at that time. And then hepatitis C doesn't always cause liver dysfunction. Some people it does, some people it doesn't. And so people would have hep C and not necessarily realize it until they were tested for some reason. And so there's not a vaccine for hepatitis C, but there are treatments that work if you have certain types of hepatitis C. If you have the main uh, genetic variant, which I think is strain one or whatever. Um, so it's a combination of drugs. And usually if you see a drug that ends in veer, that's an antiviral drug. Um, a lot of the ones that are for suppression of herpes uh, end in veer. Um, but this one is specifically for um, hepatitis C. And they saw that they could get a uh, cure in most patients within 12 weeks. Now, I don't know if this has gone down, but when I first looked it up, uh, it was like $94,000 <laughs> like to get that cure. Um, I don't know how insurance coverage goes on that. I, you know, it's hard to say, because sometimes when drugs are new, your prescriptions won't be covered. Like you have to get a coupon from the manufacturer or whatever. It's like, can I have my $94,000 coupon, please? <laughs> get rid of my hep C. So anyway, um, there is treatment for hep C now that for a lot of people is curative. Like it'll actually get rid of their viral load, it'll be zero. Um, so how does it work? So the, uh, the letipasvir, I don't know if I'm saying it right, the, the letipasvir part of it um, is inhibiting this enzyme uh, that's called NS5A. And that's used for replication, assembly, and secretion. So they're attacking the ability of the hep C to replicate by inhibiting that enzyme. And then the second part, the sofobuvir, is um, a nucleotide analog inhibitor. So it's inhibiting the enzyme in a different way. It's actually mimicking uracil. And so the drug gets incorporated into the RNA instead. And then that's not normal RNA. And so then the virus won't be able to replicate properly. So both of these components of the drug are inhibiting replication, but just in slightly different locations uh, as far as that process. So this is showing, um, again, the mechanism of action of some of the drugs that are working against hep C. So hep C likes to infect the hepatocytes, and over time that can cause chronic inflammation that can lead to scarring, uh, fibrosis, cirrhosis, liver cancer. Um, and then there are enzymes um, that the virus uses to replicate. So it uses like these proteases, it uses this NS5B polymerase. And so the Harvoni drug targets upstream and downstream. So it prevents, it actually blocks that RNA polymerase in two different spots to prevent the hepatitis C from replicating. And then there have been other drugs that have been used that also can be used in tandem, but they probably are used for anything that isn't treatable with the Harvoni, because again, Harvoni only works on genotype one, and there's, I guess, other strains of hepatitis C out there. Okay, so that's how it's inhibiting the hepatitis C. All right, as far as the anti-protozoan drugs, if you remember protozoa were things like amoeba, uh, malaria, things like that. Um, the drugs are often, um, at least in the case of malaria, 
they're either given as post-exposure or prophylactically. So when you give, uh, like when you travel somewhere, if it's a place where malaria is common, then you can take your malaria pills, which is a drug that is supposed to prevent the parasite from being able to replicate appropriately. So a lot of these drugs, um, they interfere with metabolism. So a lot of the antiprotozoal drugs interfere with metabolism, um, the ability to make ATP, they mess with the electron transport chain, um, and in the case of malaria, they attack different parts of the life cycle. So these drugs are, I guess, just a little bit different in that, like, you need to use a different drug for a different stage that that pathogen is in. Um, but a lot of the antiprotozoan drugs disrupt metabolism, and then that can be metabolism of important things like DNA, so you're not making your proper nucleic acids. So an antiprotozoan drug would be used to kill something like malaria, or if you had some kind of amoebic uh, infection. All right, um, there's a ton of different drugs for worm infections, which would be the anti-helminthic drugs, and a lot of them um, again, interfere with metabolism. <clears throat> they also increase permeability and cause spasms of the worm, and then that allows the immune system to kind of get in there and get rid of the worm. And some of them are paralytic, so they'll paralyze the offspring of the worms so that they can't latch onto the host, they can't go anywhere, and then that allows your immune system to get rid of them and allows you to pass the worms. So there are different worms for different, uh, or excuse me, different drugs for different types of worms. Like some worms are for, uh, some uh, drugs are for like flatworms, like flukes, some of them are for tapeworms, some of them are for roundworms. So you'll see different drugs for different types of worms. But some of the overall functions is that they either block metabolism or they physically paralyze the worm so that it can't move and cause further harm, so that it gives your body a chance to like get rid of it, basically. All right, so um, finally, we've talked about anti -susceptibility, antibiotic susceptibility testing in the lab. As far as why you have to do it, because resistance is very common, and so it's become fairly routine, especially if someone has a recurrent infection that you check and see which drugs will work. So if they have like a recurrent UTI, you can do a culture and susceptibility to make sure that you find the appropriate drug to treat their, um, their infection. So the way that you guys learned about in lab was called disk diffusion. Um, that was where you would have like a plate of bacteria and you put the antibiotic disk on the plate and then if it killed the bacteria, you would see a zone of clearing around. But there's also a, a slightly more expensive test, but it's a similar thing that tells you a range of concentrations that the drug will work at. And that's called an E strip, which E is for like epsilon, I don't know why. But the E strip, instead of just having one concentration, like the disc test, it has multiple concentrations. And so then you can see what your minimum inhibitory concentration is. So the minimum inhibitory concentration is like the minimum amount of drug that would inhibit that thing. And so sometimes that's useful because let's say someone has like a resistant infection, you might want to use a more toxic drug, but you wanna use the minimum amount that you can get away with so that you can reduce toxicity overall. And so that's why having the MIC, which is the minimum inhibitory concentration, it gives you a little bit more information as far as like prescribing, like what could you, what dose could you give the person specifically. So here's the difference. Um, you guys were observing this in class. So we talked about disk diffusion. You make a lawn of bacteria. You put a disk that has one concentration of antibiotic on it. And then if you see killing, that will be seen as a zone of inhibition. And the larger that zone is, the more resistant they are to that drug. So that's how you interpret that. Now the E-test, on the other hand, is actually a strip instead of a disc. 
with a range of concentrations of the drug. So in this case, um, they go all the way up from, it's usually micrograms per mil. So it goes from 32, which is the highest concentration of the drug, all the way down to like point whatever it is. And where it crosses, that is where the minimum inhibitory concentration is. So what that means is that's like the minimum you could use to kill that bacteria. So in this case, it's what, like 0.38. 0.38 is the minimum that you can use. So imagine though, like let's say you tested it and it was like up here at 12. And let's say that you really shouldn't go beyond a dose of like eight to be safe for a, per a person, right? So can you use that drug then? No. Not really, right? Like, because it's saying that you would have to <laughs> give the amount to like, you know, they say kill, kill a horse, right? Like you would have to give an amount that's too high in order to inhibit that bacteria. So maybe that would not be a good choice. So hopefully you can see how this is a little bit more information because it's giving you a range of values instead of like one value. And they both have a place, uh, I can't remember why one is preferred. I know like when we were doing uh, susceptibility on some of our isolates that we got, we did the MIC instead. So we did we used the E-strips instead of the, the DISC test. So there's probably reasons why you do one or the other. Um, the E-strips are a little bit more expensive because like I think each strip was like 50 cents to a dollar, like depending on like what drug it was. All right, um, you can also look at the mechanism specific resistance. So remember we said there was like four mechanisms of antibiotic resistance. You have um, drug degradation, target modification, decreased permeability, and efflux. Well, the um, drug um, degradation is one that you can actually see like on a plate like on a test. And so there are certain tests where they will, they're biochemical tests and the disc will turn color if that bacteria is producing that enzyme that degrades the drug. So that's what's being shown in this little picture here. They're growing some bacteria on a plate and they have this uh, little disc that's called cephalosporinase and it's detecting the byproducts of breaking down that drug. And those byproducts will only be present if that enzyme was present. So it's a way to see directly the mechanism of resistance. It's actually detecting the enzymes that are responsible for that resistance. And so that's a way that you can look for uh, the resistance is by doing these biochemical tests that'll look for the mechanism. Okay, they also have automated testing now. Um, so it's a machine. And I don't know exactly how it works, but it automatically dilutes everything and reads it. And it'll tell you, like, I guess with the help of a computer, what the resistance profile is. And they probably would use these in, like, say, a state lab or a national lab where they have a high volume of samples that they're doing. Okay, you can also use molecular techniques. So... This is showing an example of PCR, which is polymerase chain reaction. And they were looking to see um, if some of the strains were resistant to a drug called am amikacin. And amikacin is like, I can't remember if it's like a second or third line drug, but resistance to it would be concerning <laughs> because if you're resistant to amikacin, it's gonna be harder to treat those people that have TB. And so they notice that there's a certain gene associated with it. And so they amplify the DNA in the sample and the strains that have that gene, which is right here, and this one's really expressing it a lot, the band is really bright, then that is evidence, molecular evidence, that they are resistant strains. Because they've noticed that that gene is present in the strains that are resistant to amikacin. All right, so that was antibiotics. And now we're switching gears a little bit um, into the diseases. So this is the rest of the semester is the diseases. They're not all included in here. I think we only, I think in this handout, what did I give you guys to, like 22, I think? 
I think this unit is 20, 21, and 22. Should make a table of contents. Yeah, so this green booklet that you got is 20, 21, and 22. Um, but the same things that I'm just going to mention right now are going to apply to the remaining chapters. So that means your final exam is 23, 24, 25, and 26, but 25 and 26 are pretty short. Um, so it's not really that much more information. And so the rest of the um, semester is diseases by body system. Um, so like cardiovascular, respiratory, digestive, genital urinary, etc. And so for every chapter, these are some things that you might want to consider about those diseases. Not all of these questions will be answered necessarily. This isn't intended for you to have to do extra research. Although sometimes people get interested in the disease and they like to look up stuff about it, that's fine. But my notes should provide you with the information, the minimum information that you would need. Um, and then I also have another little handout that I need to make sure I post. It's called Useful Terminology. So it talks about like the stuff we've already learned about disease transmission, like um, uh, indirectly transmitted, directly transmitted, like all those like kind of vocab terms. So you should know for different pathogens, what kind of pathogen is it? Is it bacteria, virus, fungus, whatever? The body system or systems that it can affect. So you'll notice that for some pathogens, they cause more than one type of disease, but they usually have one disease they cause more than others. So for example, staph could cause pneumonia, but it's more likely to cause a skin infection. Okay, so it's being aware of those little details there. Um, the major signs and symptoms, remember signs are things that you can measure, they're objective, and that it, like something you can put a value to usually, and then symptoms are subjective, it's what the patient tells you. Um, I like to talk about complications just because they're interesting. So a complication is a rare occurrence. Or sometimes it can mean, uh, I, I never say the word right, it's like sequela, which is like long-term things that can happen. So for example, if a, if a mama has preeclampsia during pregnancy, sometimes she can have long-term elevated blood pressure afterwards. That would be sequela. So there's some diseases where there are some long-term side effects that, that can occur. Um, the virulence and pathogenicity, the morbidity and mortality, and if you don't know what those words mean, <laughs> like then it's going to be hard to like talk about that, right? And so that's where my little list of useful terms comes up. It's like, I'm not going to re-explain what morbidity is. I just assume that you know what it means at this point, because we've talked about it before. Um, How is it transmitted? So there's different routes of transmission. Um, is it common? I don't always give you, it's not like I would ever, I never make you guys memorize like a statistics, like tell me how many cases of flu there were last year. It's not about that, but it's like, is it common or is it not that common? And that's what prevalence and incidence can tell you, is how common, how frequent a disease is. Um, how is it diagnosed and treated? Um, so I'm not a clinician. I have some idea about how things are treated, but I couldn't tell you like a specific care plan. Like first you do this and then you do that, but we just talk in a general sense. Like, is this something that you can provide supportive care for? Is it something that there are medications for? Or is it something that isn't really curable? We, I kind of like to mention that. Um, notable at-risk populations, I um, like to mention that whenever possible, just because I think it makes us feel a little more secure about what our risks actually are. Like, I feel like if you take a class like this, you could get kind of scared of everything, like, oh, all the microbes are trying to get me. And I've had some people that are a little more neurotic like that, <laughs> where I could tell that they were like fearful. But I think having an idea of risk is really important. And I think that's a really important concept for um, you as um, educated people interpreting scientific information. Like a lot of it is risk assessment. Like what is my risk of this given X, Y, and Z? And then anything else that just happens to be interesting or important or whatever. Okay, so. Even though it's not that many chapters, it's still a lot of information. And so you'll notice that like in the handouts, there's a part where I have like a chart to like organize yourself. You don't have to use my chart, but it's just like you could if you wanted to, right? Like you could just use it to review. And then there's an extra credit assignment that I think has already been posted.
And it's called disease charts or something like that. And it's essentially making these for all the chapters, like all the remaining chapters, 21 through 26. So I'll try to give you guys the next handout a little bit early so that you can start working on that too for extra credit. I think it's, I forgot, it's worth a good amount of points, like 10 or 20 or something like that. I can't remember. Has anyone seen that, what I'm talking about? Okay, it's called disease charts. And this is what I'm talking about. Like that you're trying to start organizing the data a little bit to help you study for the last two exams. All right, any questions on the diseases? Okay, so these are kind of the expectations for 21 through 26. Okay, it's all the diseases by system and the pathogens. All right, so 21 is skin and eye infections. Um, we've talked about skin before as being a really good barrier. So skin, if it's intact, is hard to penetrate. Why is skin hard to penetrate? It's yeah, it's got layers to it. That's the big thing, right? Like literally it's layered. And it also has a low pH. So most things don't like low pH. And you make substances that are antimicrobial. Like you actually make your own antimicrobial substances that are on your skin. And so when skin is healthy, it's actually hard to penetrate it. But there are some pathogens that can penetrate skin, right? Like we said that some of them make enzymes that degrade skin. And some of them, if they see a small opening, they can get in even if it didn't seem like obvious to you, like a micro cut. Like, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but like if I'm gonna go get a pedicure, I'm like, they're getting the hairy legs. Cause I don't shave my legs like the day before. Like just because I feel like you have a bunch of micro cuts on the surface of your skin and then you're putting it in this like whirlpool of water that may or may not be that clean. So that's just my preference. Like I've never had any problems and I'm not saying that you would have a problem, but that's just what I, what I do. I'm like, you just deal with the Sasquatch. <laughs> All right, so I think in order to understand skin infections, you should remember what's supposed to be on the skin. So your skin is covered in gram-positive coxy. And then you have a few gram-negative, uh, gram-positive rods. Uh, pleomorphic means they take on unusual shapes. So they might be club-shaped, or they look like a comma, or they're curved, like a boomerang. And then you have very few gram-negative. And I think that that's important to recognize because if you were to um, take a sample from someone's wound and it was like teeming with gram negative, that's probably what's causing the infection. Why? Because we know that gram negatives aren't really supposed to be there in that high of a number. It doesn't mean that there's no gram negatives on your skin, but you would, you know, be, it would be suspect in the presence of an infection to see that many gram negative, like they're probably a pathogen. And then you do have some yeast on your skin. You have candida, which can cause yeast infections. And then uh, there's a yeast called Malsezia furfur that actually is associated with dandruff. So the way that it likes to munch on your scalp causes the flaking and the itchiness associated with dandruff. Okay, your mucous membranes are like your inside skin, but they are built a little bit differently. They're not layered, but they're folded to maximize surface area so that you can absorb as much as you need to, say, in the gut. Um, but they do have cilia, which will protect you by kind of flushing things out, their little finger-like projections. And then they also have mucus-producing cells. And one of the important components of mucus is IgA. IgA is the main mucosal antibody that protects your mucous membranes from infections. All right, so skin disease is really common, okay? Like this is probably one of the most common like hospital complications, right? Because a surgical wound can easily become infected. Um, so the daily value is 36 million plus, which means that 36 million years of quality life are lost due to dealing with skin infections. Um, so some people who are older or have issues where they don't heal very well, like that's why with some procedures they will tell you do not smoke for a couple months before that procedure because it, it impedes healing. It's known to impede the healing process. So a lot of people have skin infections. The most common is acne, actually. So acne is the most common skin infection. 
And then 25% of people can get skin infections in the hospital. And those are called nosocomial infections when it's in the hospital. And that increases surgical recovery time by seven days. That's a week, okay? So that's not negligible at all, which is why infection control in the hospital remains so important because you're, you're increasing recovery time if it's complicated by an infection. All right, this is um, showing a little bit about where in the skin pathogens might mm, uh, manifest, like where they would affect. So a lot of the viral pathogens actually like to hide in the nerve and they reactivate later. So that's why like cold sores can pop up where you get stressed out because they'll reactivate from the nerve. Most skin infections are gonna be um, in the dermis. And so a lot of fungal infections are gonna be in the dermis. And then some of the bacterial infections like hepatito, um, folliculitis is actually down in the follicle, like in the hair follicle. But a lot of bacterial infections are gonna be either in the epidermis or in this middle layer that's called the dermis. So like cellulitis is where the dermis is infected. If it goes beneath the dermis, then that's when you get stuff like necrotizing fasciitis, which is the flesh-eating disease that's caused by streptiogenes. And if it goes underneath that into the muscle, then that's when you get myonecrosis, and that's gas gangrene, which is caused by Clostridium perfringens, which is a relative of Clostridium difficile, which is C. diff. So they're different diseases. Um, so yeah, basically, um, that's kind of how I would, in my mind, maybe organize these is by the layer of skin that they impact. So most of them are going to be more in the dermis or the epidermis, but then there are a few pathogens that can, that can colonize lower than that and cause more damage. All right, so your risk factors for getting these infections are kind of the same as anything else. And you guys might notice that, like if I asked you for any disease, what is a risk factor for getting that disease? Regardless of age or anything, what would you say? What do you think is the biggest risk factor for getting a disease? Being immunocompromised. Okay, that, like, that's just like across the board. So you'll see that come up over and over again. There's different reasons you can be immunocompromised. You could be on immunosuppressive drugs, you could have a pre-existing condition, you could be a cancer patient, you could just be really stressed, can cause you to be immunocompromised a little bit. Um, obviously with skin diseases, what would you say is probably the most relevant risk factor on this list? Previous skin trauma. Previous skin trauma, okay, like that, that makes the most sense, right? I did list all of them, but obviously some are gonna be more important than others, right? Now why do you think elderly age is on there? Besides the immunocompromise, what's up with older skin? Yeah, their skin's really, it's thin, right? They don't have as good of collagen, like it's not as, it doesn't heal as well, you know? And that's related to the vascular insufficiency too, right? Because in order to get good healing, you need good blood flow. So if you have a condition where your blood flow is not as good, you might have poorer healing, which means your skin infections can be worse. So we see that old people, you know, they have their frail, delicate little skin. If they're immobile, they're not able to move very well. They can get pressure ulcers. Those get infected. So they have more risk. But really, I think it boils down to skin trauma. Like your propensity for skin trauma is kind of dependent on your age, right? Like, and, and then other risk factors. Um, so this is kind of an interesting chart I came across. And this isn't like necessarily something that you guys need to know. But I found it really interesting that they had uh, this list of particular pathogens and what they are specifically associated with. So they have like a risk factor and then the associated pathogen. So like people that have cirrhosis are more likely to get wound infections with like these gram negatives. Um, people that get bitten by another human there's a, I know, right? There's this kid at my kid's school that's like a biter. 
And the funny thing is, is like he came to the birthday party and he seemed like a normal kid, but apparently him and my son like butt heads, like they're not a good match. So um, anyway, but you know, human bites are pretty gross because people have bacteria in their mouth. Um, some rat bite wounds, I was like, who's getting bitten by rats? But I guess people can have pet rats, right? And then they have um, a type of streptobacillus in their mouth. So I just thought this was really interesting, reptile contact. Um, you know, you really should wash your hands after you play with like a pet turtle or anything because they have salmonella and that can cause infection. So I just found this really interesting that they had identified some very specific risk factors with particular pathogens. And so you actually do see that with diseases is that they might only be a risk in very particular circumstances. Like you're not going to get streptobacillus mono formants unless you get bitten by a rat, okay, which is like kind of an obscure risk factor. So I just thought that was kind of funny. Um, this one is talking about virulence factors. So remember we said that virulence factors help them cause disease. And so notice that what seems to predominate is adherence, which kind of makes sense, right? Like in order to invade the skin, you have to attach to it, and toxin production. So they make some nasty toxins that degrade connective tissue. And again, I don't make you guys memorize, I didn't make you memorize all the virulence factors like specifically, but if you were asked like, what are the virulence factors associated with skin infections? You'd be like, oh, toxin production and adherence factors seem to be most relevant, okay, to having a skin infection occur. All right, so a lot of people will say skin infections are contagious. Because I think when you're first learning about diseases, you think everything is easy to get. Um, but skin infections are actually not that contagious. Like you would have to come into contact with like a lesion, like someone's open stuff, which you could, or you would have to get a contaminated object. But some of them are contagious because they're respiratory diseases that manifest as skin diseases. So like chickenpox is really contagious. Um, but it's, but staph infections are not that contagious. Like you would have to rub your staph on someone to like really be able to transmit. And even then they would have to have an opening for that to occur. Okay. Um, so the general symptoms we're all kind of familiar with, um, what's erythema? It's just redness, right? And then pain and tenderness, uh, warmth. Pyoderma, pus, okay, so pus in the skin, yeah, pus skin condition, and then dysfunction, especially in the lower limbs, due to the swelling and the pain that can occur, and it's usually acute, so what does acute mean? Short, so you don't usually have to deal with it forever unless it becomes complicated, and really, if you look at those signs and symptoms, what are those a sign of? Infection and inflammation. Okay, so a lot of the symptoms of your skin disease are due to inflammation that's being caused by the infective agent. All right, so not all rashes or bumps mean you have a disease, but sometimes they can, depending on the clinical presentation, I guess. If you have a skin rash, they call that exanthem, and if you have a rash on the mucous membranes, they call that enanthem. So there are some viral infections where you can have like a rash on inside of your mouth. Or like with strep, you almost look like you have a rash on your tonsils. Like it, 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 sometimes you can get like little weird red bumps too. And they're classified by their elevation, their size, where they are, um, their texture basically. So this is uh, just an example of some of the lesions. And some of them are more relevant to us as studying micro than others are. Um, so for example, if we look at panel C, that's called a macule. A macule is like a flat rash. It's flush with the skin. So that could be a freckle, but it could also be how they describe measles. Because measles is a macular rash. It looks like you got little slaps like all over. Like it's like little red flat patches. Papillomas are, are warts. So when we talk about HPV, that's the lesion. It's called the papilloma. Um, petechiae and purpura in panel F, those are bruises or bleeds under the skin. 
And that can be due to inflammatory conditions or infections, but it can also be due to physical damage, like trauma um, to your skin. Um, if we look at H, that's a pustule. Why is it called a pustule? It's filled with pus. And that's like a classic sign of infection, right? Um, when you have pus, it means the immune system is like acting on it. Um, vesicles are blisters. So they don't, it, a, a pustule is a pus-filled vesicle. And a vesicle is usually where there's clear fluid. So sometimes the lesions will go through an evolution. Like chicken pox will start off as a vesicle. And then it becomes a pustule. And then it breaks open and it becomes an ulcer, which is like a hole or an erosion. So sometimes you can diagnose these different skin infections based off of the type of lesions that you're seeing. Primary lesions are the ones that show up initially, and then secondary lesions are something that can occur because of a primary lesion. So like, let's say your primary lesion was like a, um, a fissure. A fissure is a crack in the skin, and that can get infected and then cause a pustule, I guess. So that would be like the secondary condition. All right, so diagnostic tests for these soft tissue infections, um, a lot of them involve blood cultures, but depending on where it is, like if it's on just a regular part of your body, um, really, unless it's a severe infection, you're gonna culture it. But oftentimes they don't even culture it. What they do is look at the rash and look at the risk factors for the person and assume the most common thing that it probably is by your risk factors. So for example, um, if it was a person that was like a little kid and they had a little crusty rash on their face, they're probably gonna think it's epitigo. And so then they're gonna assume that it's staph and they're gonna treat it as such. So usually the only, the other tests are for like, if it was a severe infection. And then especially if they're in your face or your head, that's considered more severe because it's closer to like your brain. And so you'd wanna be more careful with that. All right, so there's my chart where you might wanna organize. And the next thing we're gonna do is go through these different causes. So I think for gram positive, we have um, staph and strep and clostridium. And then for gram negative, we have pseudomonas. And then for fungal, it's like Canada and the dermatophytes. And then viral, it's like chickenpox, measles, and HPV. All right, so one of the things that we've been talking about in lab is telling the difference between staph that is dangerous and staph that isn't. So typically staph epi is not harmful. It's rarely pathogenic. It doesn't have a lot of virulence factors. It actually is normal flora. Staph aureus is more often pathogenic due to the inflammation that it triggers. And so part of what we were talking about in the lab last time was telling the difference between staph aureus and not staph aureus, because aureus is more likely to be a pathogen. So this is the testing that you guys actually saw last week. If you look at staph on a gram stain, it's always gonna look like this, but when you grow it on mannitol salt auger, you're gonna see that staph aureus ferments the mannitol and staph epi does not. Staph aureus is coagulase positive, staph epi is negative. So it doesn't, it's not really surprising if you recognize that coagulase is a virulence factor. The ability to clot blood is contributing to virulence, and so it makes more sense that staph aureus would be coagulase positive. Because we said that historically, staph aureus is the pathogenic staph when it comes to infections. So what does staph do? All kinds of stuff in the epidermis and the dermis. So if one hair follicle is inflamed with staph, then that's called folliculitis. If it's deeper infection, that's called a boil. And sometimes they have to be lanced so that you can treat them appropriately. And then if multiple follicles are involved, that's called a carbuncle. So I always think of it as like a multi-headed pimple 
Like, I don't know if you've ever been fortunate enough to have one of those, like in your adolescence. But um, it's where multiple hair follicles are involved. And then that tends to be more likely to cause a fever. So it's more of a systemic response. And so all of these lesions, folliculitis, sty, boil, carbuncle, they are most commonly caused by staph aureus. So here's the difference between them. Folliculitis can be due to ingrown hairs because as the hair grows back down into the skin, it can um, push the bacteria under the skin. And so that happens a lot in areas where you might shave or have short hairs. A sty is where it's in particular your eyelash. So I always remember a sty in your eye. Um, abscess uh, can start off being very innocuous. Like it looks like a little pimple or a bug bite. And then it can progress into a boil, which is also called a furuncle. And then the carbuncle is, again, more massive, deeper, multiple follicles involved. So a lot of times uh, men will get it in, in the back of their neck, like, like this guy does, where those short little hairs become ingrown from shaving with clippers. And then that can push bacteria into the skin and cause a little infection there. All right, um, not all staph is MRSA. So a lot of times when people are first learning about MRSA, they think all staph is resistant. A lot of it is, but I don't know the prevalence anymore. I'm not sure what the prevalence anymore. And it used to be only hospital strains were resistant. But now the hospital strains are in the community, and the community strains are in the hospital. So it's all, like, mixed up. Um, the way that MRSA is MRSA is that it has collected some genes through horizontal gene transfer that allow it to degrade the drug or target modification. But they've also seen some strains that do the other methods as well. They've seen strains that do efflux, and they've seen strains that do decreased permeability. And so remember, when you're resistant to a drug, that means that the drug is not going to work. And that's really where the virulence comes from, is that you then have fewer options to treat. And so your prognosis can be a little bit uh, more guarded, I guess. So this was a case study that I came across when I went down some Google hole, where uh, this group of people ended up getting uh, the USA strain of MRSA, the Murica 300 strain of MRSA. And when they talked to the people, they realized that they all had one risk factor in common. And that was getting some sketchy tattoos done. Um, not in a parlor, but like jailhouse garage tattoos. So these are people that had made like homemade machines and were using like not sterile equipment. Probably didn't know about infection control. And in fact, one person reported anecdotally seeing lesions on the hand of the person. So I was like, why did you see what their hands look like? Because they weren't wearing gloves, right? So if you're going to get a tattoo, don't get a prison tattoo. Um, and then basically they had to go talk to the, the people. It was young people primarily. And they're like, hey, don't do that. And uh, they didn't see any more cases. So luckily the people were treated. But also to me, the bummer about this, although I'm sure the tattoos were excellent quality, right? Like so great artistically, is that you can like lose the tattoo if it gets infected. That's like the worst thing that can happen with a new tattoo is that it gets infected because then you're gonna have like scarring and then your immune system's gonna try to kick it out. Like it's gonna actually, like the ink will like come out. And so that's like, that's why taking care of it is so important after you get the tattoo so that you maintain the color and the design. Otherwise you just wasted, you know, all your money and, and that pain for nothing. So um, tattoos are like an open wound, like basically. Like you got stabbed like a bunch of times and so you just have to make sure you like take care of it. So no sketchy tattoos, and you won't get the America strain of MRSA. Okay. All right, other things that staph is associated with, empatigo, which I always think of it as something funky little kids get. So empatigo causes these like crusty little lesions and pustules to form, and they can transmit it to others. They can also auto-inoculate themselves. So you can move it from one part of your own body to another. And then a more serious manifestation is this scalded skin syndrome which is due to strains of staph that have a certain toxin, that have a toxin that's called super antigen that overstimulates the immune system. So this is the difference. Empatigo is really common, and it is potentially contagious because the goo from the crust can be passed from one person to another. And then scalded skin syndrome is very rare, 
And it usually happens in neonates, and that's why it's really important to wash your hands if you are holding someone's newborn, is that staph that is on your body or in your nose can be harmless to you, but in a baby that was just born that doesn't have a mature immune system, it can manifest as a very serious infection. And so in this case, the reason they call it scalded skin syndrome is that your skin like looks like it burned off, like it literally peels off like the epidermis. And then of course that would make you more prone to secondary infections. So it's very rare, but it is something that's just really startling, which is why I like to just kind of bring it up because it's kind of interesting. All right, strep is the other gram positive that we were trying to identify in lab. And if you remember, we talked about some strep is hemolytic. And so strep that is pathogenic in humans is usually beta or alpha hemolytic. The beta hemolytic strep is group A, and the alpha hemolytic strep is like strep pneumoniae, which causes pneumonia. So they look different under the gram stain. They're more arranged in chains instead of clusters. And if you remember when we did the catalase test, we said that staph was catalase positive, but strep is catalase negative. So strep group A is the most common cause of strep disease in humans, like one of the more common ones. All right, so strep group A can cause cellulitis or rarely necrotizing fasciitis, which is the flesh-eating disease. So which one is more common? Cellulitis is like way more common than necrotizing fasciitis. So I try to find the most tame pictures of necrotizing fasciitis that I can because it can be pretty gnarly. Um, erysipelas, which is also known as cellulitis, is an infection with group A strep in the dermis. And so it used to be more common, I think, too, in cases where people had untreated strep growth. It can manifest into a dermal infection. But you see it more frequently in older people, too. Again, probably due to differences in their immune system, that it's more likely that the strep can get down into the dermis. Now with necrotizing fasciitis, it's a rare uh, manifestation. Sometimes you might have a microscopic cut or abrasion. You don't even know that it's there, and then the bacteria can get in, and they can cause rapid tissue destruction. So necrotizing means dead. Fasciitis means inflammation of the fascia, and so this can go down beyond the subcutaneous fat into the fascia uh, and the muscle and destroy that tissue. So a lot of times the only treatment Last resort for necrotizing fasciitis is amputation to stop the infection from spreading. All right, um, another one that causes a deep tissue infection potentially is Clostridium perfringens. Clostridium perfringens is a nasty little cousin of Clostridium difficile, which is C. diff. So this is a cousin, which is called Clostridium perfringens. It's a gram-positive rod and it's a spore former. And when those spores get deposited into a wound, then it can manifest as what's called gas gangrene. So gas gangrene is also called myonecrosis. The gas production is due to the fermentation of sugars undergoing uh, by the bacteria as they're breaking down that tissue. And usually, again, this is one where surgery is necessary, debridement, possible amputation. There's been experiment with hyperbaric chamber. Hyperbaric chamber is where you put someone in a chamber with extra oxygen because these guys are um, anaerobes, so they, they can be killed or slowed down by oxygen. So the most common cause of um, getting clostridium perfringens is having some kind of traumatic wound of some sort or surgery, and it can be fatal within 24 hours. It spreads really rapidly through the tissues. A lot of the pain is due to the gas production it separates the fascia from the muscle, which is obviously painful, and then it has to find a way out. So you, it finds the path of least resistance, and you end up getting those bubbles forming on the skin. So a lot of times, clostridium perfringens would only be considered dangerous if it has the toxin. And so like we talked about before, you can use PCR to identify strains that have toxin genes present, and then that's how you can identify if this is a particularly virulent strains. So the major virulence factors associated with gas gangrene are the toxin production and collagenase production. So they literally degrade collagen, which is holding your tissue together. And so that's how they're able to cause such devastating tissue damage. 
All right, this is our lone gram negative. It's not the only one that causes skin infections, but it is like the most common. And that's Pseudomonas. So this is the same Pseudomonas that we use in lab. Pseudomonas is just around. It's in water, it's in soil. And so if you're in like an underchlorinated pool or a not well-kept hot tub, you can get like a pool rash, which is basically folliculitis. It's what causes swimmer's ear which is where you have an infection in your outer ear, like kind of the opening of your ear. Um, it's been associated with um, ventilator-associated pneumonia. So this was a case study I came across where this poor young guy had had a lung transplant, and at some point he aspirated and ended up getting a pneumonia with pseudomonas. And it makes this dark green pigment, and that was from the bronchoscopy. You could see the layer of pseudomonas down in the lungs, like just settled in there. Unfortunately, that, that guy didn't make it. Um, it's the most common cause of burn wound infection. So if you ever see a wound that has a greenish tinge to it, it's a good chance that it is Pseudomonas because Pseudomonas makes this green pigment as part of its normal metabolism. And so you can see that in the wounds. So Pseudomonas is something that is just around. Um, it has virulence factors that allow it to cause um, these tissue infections, folliculitis, uh, like respiratory infections too. All right, um, the most common fungal infection is probably ringworm. So ringworm is caused by um, these fungus that are called dermatophytes. And the Latin term for ringworm is tinea. So it's just tinea wherever it is. So like tinea captitis, like your cap, that's your scalp. Um, tinea uh, barbe, like barber, that's your beard. So if you do have a beard, you need to like wash your beard and like dry it and take care of it because you can get funky infections underneath your beard. Um, most people could get ringworm, but it's more common in kids. It's more common in adolescents. And I think, again, because of their risk factors of getting exposed to either animals or soil or just poor hygiene, they're able to transmit it um, to different parts of their body and from one person to another. Okay, so how do you diagnose ringworm? A lot of it's just looking at the rash. So ringworm is a misnomer. It's not a worm, it's a fungus. But if you know about, about worms, that doesn't look like a worm at all, like because it's all segmented like little cells, basically. So ringworm is almost like a mold. It's like a mold-like fungus. And it will fluoresce under UV light. You can culture it, but it grows kind of slow. You can do a skin scraping and then do the KOH test, which is where you add KOH, which is potassium hydroxide, you add it to the skin cells, and it'll kill all the skin cells, and then the ringworm will just be there like, hello, I'm here. And so then you can just treat with antifungals. Like, you can actually treat ringworm usually over the counter. And so if you were to describe ringworm to someone, you'd be like, well, it's a really common fungal skin infection that affects primarily younger people, and it's not really life-threatening. Like, it's not life-threatening at all. You can treat it with over-the-counter medications for the most part. Okay, candida can be a little bit more serious. It's actually a yeast. And so candida can cause systemic infections in HIV patients. But as I joked about before, it's usually causing, causing the formunda, like from under your butt, from under your boobs, from under your stomach. So anywhere that you have like warm patches, like your armpit or under your belly, you can get candida infections. Um, babies get it in their mouth, and that's called thrush. Um, yeah, the little neck folds. I know, the little folds are so cute, but they're funky too. You gotta wipe the neck folds. Any of you who haven't had a baby yet, just remember that for the future. You gotta wipe, wipe the neck folds. Yeah, <laughs> they get your little funk under there. I always call it a, it's like his neck funk. Like, that's what I call it. Every time after you eat, so I gotta go clean the neck funk. So anyway, um, yeah, Canada is just on your body. So it's just naturally on your body. And then if certain circumstances happen, it can overgrow. So like if you get rid of the good bacteria on your body, or if they're not established yet. So like, I think we've talked about this before, like one of the side effects of some strong antibiotics is that women can get yeast infection because it'll kill all the good bacteria in the vaginal tract and then it allows the yeast to overgrow. So you can culture these. There actually is selective media for different candidates, which is kind of cool. So this candidate turns this color, that one turns that color, that one turns that color, and that's a way that you can identify them. The one that is the most clinically relevant, usually, is candida albicans. But there are some candida out there that are like going crazy in the hospital setting that are actually causing resistant fungal infection. 
So um, Candida is very good at adhering, it's good at invading, and it's good at colonizing. Um, and it likes to uh, basically hang out on the skin. It's really good at forming a biofilm. And part of its, I guess, metabolic byproducts is what causes you to have low-key inflammation which is why then that rash gets so irritating and itchy because of the inflammation that you're having in response to the candida. All right, so that was the, ye the fungus. Um, and now moving on to a little bit about the viral skin diseases. So the first one on here is measles, which that's the disease, and the virus is called rubiola. Measles should be eradicated, but it's not, and probably too because it's so contagious. If people don't vaccinate, then measles will come again. So this little map up here um, was showing some cases in 2015. And if you notice, there was a ton of cases in California that was associated with like a Disneyland outbreak where someone came from some other country and were under vaccinated and had measles. And apparently measles virus can hang out in the air for like hours afterwards. And so there was a blip in cases where it went up significantly because of that. Also with the anti-vaccination or vaccine hesitancy, we do have some pockets of the US where the kids are not vaccinated. They're not at full vaccination level. And so we have it happen. So measles is super contagious, causes a mildish illness, a flu-like illness. And then it manifests as a macular rash, which is a flat uh, rash. So the incubation period is kind of long. And I think that's another thing that makes it so transmissible is that if you feel fine, you're more likely to spread it, right? Because you're just acting normal, basically. So some people say, oh, measles isn't a big deal. Like, it's okay if my kid gets measles. And I'm like, no, because even though this is like a one, less than one in a million, there are complications associated with measles. And one of them is this thing that's called subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. So basically you end up with holes in your brain because the virus, the measles virus goes latent and then it reactivates in the nervous system. And so then these kids like three or four years after recovery end up getting like dementia. Like they basically get what amounts to like an ALS type presentation. And so it is really rare, yes. But why? Like, why would you even let that be a thing when there's a vaccine that is highly efficacious and safe? So there are some complications associated with measles, like um, viral, like endocarditis, um, meningitis, hearing loss, like, and then this scary disease here. So it's showing what the normal brain life looks like, and you see that it's full of healthy brain tissue versus a brain that has this rare measles complication. So measles actually binds in a way that's similar to the flu virus um, to the mucous membranes and the airways and the upper airways. And then it um, basically is, this is just showing a general um, like replication process, which is really similar to other RNA viruses. But, um, I, and actually I should know this, but I actually don't know what antibodies the MMR vaccine has you create. But if I, if, I, if I had to guess, it's probably something to do with it attaching to the host cell. All right, rubella, which is the R in NMR, because measles is, uh, it's measles, mumps, and rubella. Uh, R rubella is German measles, and a lot of people don't even know they have it. Like that rash looks like a, allergy rash. But the reason that it's of note is because in pregnant women in the early trimester, like the first trimester, it's been known to cause severe birth defects back in the day. So one of the things you do when you find out you're pregnant, that initial blood work, they look at your rubella tighter, like to see, to see that you're immune to uh, rubella. All right, herpes simplex one and two are what cause cold sores or herpetic lesions? Yeah, Cindy. Um, it makes IgM and IgG, if, you, if IgM is found in your, your blood but not IgG, you may have had a recent infection. If IgG is present but not IgM, it could mean that you had an infection in the past or that you have a vaccine. For rubella? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so IgM is recent infection. Yes. IgG is long-term, either previous infection or previous vaccination. Yes. 
just okay. Um, all right, herpes simplex one and two, they can test you for herpes antibodies too, the same principle, the, IG, the IgM and the IgG. Um, herpes simplex one is typically cold sore. So it hides, it, it is latent in the trigeminal nerve, which is in your face. And then herpes simplex two is usually the one that's associated with genital herpes and it hides in the sacral uh, nerves in your lower back, which kind of makes sense because of where the lesions manifest. Um, but apparently one can go down and two can go up. <laughs> so depending on your sexual activity, it is possible that you could transfer it in different ways. And so if anyone had a cold sore, like don't let them go down there. Okay, that's my, that's my advice, my technical advice. Um, there's not a vaccine for herpes. Um, there's not really a cure either. You just take medication that, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Suppression, uh, suppression of uh, symptoms and outbreaks. So um, herpes simplex is another example of a latent virus. So it has the ability to um, establish a latency. And latency is kind of an advantage to it because if it's latent, then your immune system is not going to pay attention to it. And that gives it the chance to persist. If the immune system goes down later, then it can reactivate. And the thing is, is that hiding in the nerves is actually a good hiding spot because in your nervous system, your immune system is not as strong because you want to protect the nerves and too much inflammation is bad. And so it's kind of a, a good spot for it to hide. It's kind of a smart idea. Like let's hide in a part of the body where I can be ignored. And that's kind of where that latency idea comes from. It gives them a chance to persist without being bothered. But latent infections can reactivate and that's when you would see symptoms flare up again. So this is showing, um, kind of the difference between cold sore and genital herpes. The genital herpes lesions look, uh, to me, more painful in some ways because there's a lot more fluid in them. Um, the oral lesion is kind of more of a pustule and then it kind of crusts over. And so you're fairly contagious when you have an actual uh, lesion on your uh, mouth. And this is different than a canker sore, by the way. The canker sores are the ones that are internal, usually due to like, how you got burned by like saltiness. This is usually more of an actual like, crusty kind of pustule thing. And so the drugs that you take for cold sores are Abriva and for general herpes is Valtrex. And they basically act here by inhibiting the DNA polymerase that's used by the virus. So they're not able to um, <clears throat> like make their DNA and replicate. And then it also blocks um, attachment so that they can't get into those cells and cause um, that infection to occur. All right, I'm going to stop there for now, and we will do it with this next time. We'll take a brief break, and I'll see you guys in the lab. Have a good day.